Hello, this is Truth Be Told Transformation, and I'm Bonnie Burkert, here to share tools for transformation, to live your highest truth. So one of the things I say as I drive around Los Angeles is, oh my God, that person's driving like a banshee. And I don't think I necessarily even know where that word comes from or why I say it, but I definitely think it means something, let's just say evil. <laughs> so to further describe and, and teach us all, what Banshee means? Am I using it incorrectly? I've invited a special guest, an author of the wonderful Llewellyn Publications, which has sent us so many wonderful speakers for the show. A big welcome to Stephen J. Rolfs. Thank you. Thank Hi, you very Stephen. much for having me. <laughs> Well, um, you know, it's great to have you, and I'm super you know, excited to learn more about Banshees and learn more about all the different stories you're going to be telling us in your new book on Llewellyn called Beware the Banshees Cry. Ooh. The Folklore and History of Messengers of Death. I sp about 80% of the book is devoted to the Irish Banshee. Okay. And then we have stuff from Scotland and Wales. Well, some really creepy stuff from Wales. And from there, the rest of the book, I go all over the world. I go down into Central Europe uh, with my people in uh, Germany, up into Norway, even go out your uh, way on the West Coast with La Llorona, who is herself a messenger. Her death. And it's interesting that she said um, people driving like a banshee. Normally, banshees don't drive, but I do have a case in the book where they hitchhiked. There was a man, uh, this was in the early part of the 19th 1900s, 20th century, and he was driving a, uh, a wagon home one night, and his two children were in the hospital, uh, very ill, and of course his mind was very much uh, concerned with, you know, their health, would they make it, and all of a sudden he hears the horrible screeching of the banshee. And he looks around and he gets the horse to go a bit faster. And the horse had absolutely no objection to that. That horse wanted to put a lot of Irish real estate between himself and the creature making that sound. <laughs> but as fast as they kept going, the sound was the same. And finally, he had the nerve to look around and wouldn't you know, there was a creature like an old hag sitting in the back of his wagon and screeching. And he knew this was the Banshee, but what can you do now? I mean, you can't stop and throw her out. You can't touch her. You want to get away from her. And she's just doing her thing. Well, uh, soon they came near a cottage and the banshee vanished. Um, obviously did not want to frighten the people inside of the cottage. And very sadly, the next day, uh, the man found out that his daughter had died overnight. Turns out the banshee always knows. Oh, okay. But speaking of riding banshees, yeah. Uh, if, if, if I may, real quick, there is something called the Coach of Bower. Now, if you are familiar with those marvelous horror movies from the 1960s by Mario Bava, the Italian ones with the ornate sets and the gothic look, yeah, this is a the Coach of Bower is a coach. Uh, done in black, probably has skulls and such on it. And very often, the Banshee will ride in the uh, Coach of Bauer. She rides in style. And the uh, driver is what you call a Dullahan. And the Dullahan is like a regular person, except he has no head. 
And should you ever encounter the Coach of Bauer on an Irish road at night, you have to run and throw yourself on the ground and then cover cover your head so that no one so that you cannot see the Coach of Bauer as it passes, because the banshee inside might stop, open the door and take an extra passenger. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, definitely getting goosebumps here. This is good. This is really good. Um, you know, when you mentioned the, uh, that's a headless horseman, right? The Sleepy Hollow uh, uh, legend. They say that's where Washington Irving got his idea for his uh Headless horseman. Right on. Uh, so these are um, these are Celtic traditions, correct? These are Celtic yes, tales. Yes. All right. And so uh, that could be um, the Celts were. You know, we think of them only Ireland, but the Celts were kind of in a lot of different regions in Europe, oh, correct? They, they were all over Western Europe, of course, England and Scotland, Wales, the Isle of Man, uh, even down into France and such. Ah, yeah. And they were quite fierce warriors at the time too. Interesting. So let's talk about let's talk about the banshee. Okay. So you told us some stories, but uh, you know, is it a ghost? It's not merely a ghost, right? I mean, oh, you asked exactly the right question. The banshee can be one of three different things. First, it could be the ghost of a member of the family from maybe three, four hundred years ago she loved the family so much that she doesn't want to leave banshees are always female ah. and or she could be someone who absolutely hated the family and takes great delight in announcing their deaths i have a few uh, examples of that in the book now if she's not a ghost she might be what we call a Fairy. Oh. Now, I I don't like the term fairy because that's a pseudonym, meaning uh, the fair ones or the gentry. The actual term would be Tuatha de Danan. Uh, people who watch your show, I'm sure they're already quite familiar with it. Well, tell me the, the term name, again. Can I, I can I get that word again, please? Tuatha de Danan. Is that a D-A-N-A-A-N, Irish? Is that Irish or Celtic? Oh yes, that's Celtic. That's okay. Celtic. Okay. And that goes um, the name Banshee itself. Well, what we hear as Banshee is actually an incorrect uh, way of saying Banshee, which oh. means a woman of the mound. And, of course, the mound is the fairy mound. Okay. I often refer to uh, what we call fairies as the she, those of the fairy mound. Okay. You know, there's a third possibility, and you're going to like this. The banshee may well be a goddess. There is, as I get my little cheat sheet out there, A number of uh, famous banshees connected to prominent families. Banshees only go to one family. And these have the same appearance and the same name as Celtic goddesses. And if I, I, I'll give one example real quick here. That would be Aine. Aine was the goddess of the sun, of summer, of beautiful days, of fertility, of both the crops, of the animals, and the people. And she has a ritual that was performed quite often on the feast of St. John the Baptist on the my goodness, I can't say this name. Okay, it says the hilltop near the grave of the three. Okay. And it's in Irish, and I won't embarrass you. You can just read the further. book. Read the book. And then you can try <laughs> to pronounce it yourself. And there is a ritual where people will gather on top of that hill 
and they light torches. And then they take these lit torches and they run in all directions to the various different farms and the fields. And of course, you know, Feast of St. John the Baptist is the summer solstice. I did not know that. Cool. <laughs> Love that. So, so basically, they co-opted, oh, sorry, that sounds rude, doesn't it? But it seems like there's no, co- no coincidence that they, those are happening on the same day. That's what I'm trying to say. There is a great deal of mysticism connected with St. John the Baptist. Mm. I probably should not go into that because I don't feel like uh, telling the priest that in confession. Yes, I I was (laughs) blasphemous. But I think that sounds like another book right there, uh, Stephen. A decided possibility. But uh, there is another goddess, and I bet you were thinking when I listed the other ones, Clotha, Abiel, Cleona, but the, possibly the one most closely connected to the Banshee is Morrigan. Ah, uh, yes. And I know, I know you've heard of her. I have. She is actually the Morrigan, because she is three separate goddesses, each one darker than the other, goddesses of death and battle. Nemon, who causes uh, panic on a battlefield. Maka, who takes the form of a crow overhead of a battle waiting for lunch. And Balb. In fact, Balb, B-A-D-B, is the name given to the Banshee in South East Ireland. Okay. Southeast. All right. Very interesting to just anticipate that, you know, distinctive cultures even within a small country. Oh, ab- absolutely. There are at least 15 different words to describe the Banshee. And like I say, the words we're using is the worst of the litter. Fantastic. But, yeah. Wow. But that's Such a very, very rich lore. Yes. This is really incredible. So, um, and I, I was going to definitely ask, where did the actual term come from? So we're talking about the Celts here. Do you yes. have examples in your book, I think you do, of other, and you sort of mentioned in the beginning, of banshees or a similar type of messenger of death from other cultures, faraway cultures? Well, let me see now. Uh, of course, I could just go right across the Irish Sea to Scotland. They had the Cana Teach, uh, which is essentially the same thing as the, uh, as the Banshee in Ireland. Now, if we go down where my people are in uh, Germany and throughout Central Europe, they have what is called the Weisse Frau, mm-hmm. the white woman. Yeah, and this this is the stuff of gothic horror here. <laughs> nice. You can just imagine Bring Bring on it. a lightning strike, summer night, and the wind howling, and in the hallway of a manor, here comes this ghostly woman dressed in white, you know, right out of the haunted mansion. But instead of a hatchet, uh, she might be carrying a candle. And to see her means that someone in the household is going to die. Hmm. Now, this is found with a lot of, just like the Irish prominent families have their banshee, prominent uh, German and Teutonic families have their Weissefrau, including the Hohenzollerns. Now, the Hohenzollerns were, of course, the ruling family of uh, Germany for hundreds of years, ending with the reign of Kaiser Wilhelm II and that little mess known as the First World War. But they they also had their own Weisse Frau. If I can real quickly tell a quick tale about that. Oh, please, it don't even have to be quick. Uh, there was in, I believe it was the Neuschloss in Bohemia, the Hohenzollern 
uh, ruling family was visiting and one of the princesses, I guess she's like a teenage girl, she was standing in a hallway in front of a mirror, just trying on a hat, seeing how she looks. And she sees out of the corner of her eye, someone is walking behind her. She figures it's one of the servants. So she just asks, what time is it? And a ghostly voice replies, it is 10 o'clock, mein Liebe, my love. And she turns around, and here is the Hohenzollern uh, Weissefrau uh, looking at her with dead eyes and a smirk on her face. And it wasn't too much longer after that that she died. Well, no. Yeah. The Banshee and the Weissefrau always know so when you say not too much longer i'm assuming she made it through the night uh, long enough to tell the story um correct i imagine so yeah. yes i bet she told everybody <laughs> um okay so what about what about italy i mean so we do do, do we have cases of italy in italy greece i have a few cases there is one and i couldn't come of any instances of it, but it is the girl with the hairy arm. And the arm appears in a wall, and it kind of knocks things over to uh, make its presence known. Oh, yeah. There is a, also a Irish banshee story from Italy in which a count was uh, very sad after the death of his wife. And the people at this hotel, this was back in the 1920s, and it was a kind of a luxury hotel, the jazz age, and the beautiful people were there. And a lady kept noticing that this old man, who was an Italian count, kept going out alone. He would eat alone, then he would go out on the balcony, and he would not say anything. And she asked people, they found out, yes, that is the, uh, that's the Count Nelsini. And his wife died of recently, and he, he's, he's very upset. Well, this lady decided, okay, I'm going to go out and at least give my condolences or something. And she goes out, and there he is standing, but there is a young woman in a green emerald sparkly dress standing right next to him. And she has her arm on the shul his shoulder, and they're both just looking out into the water, not saying anything. Well, she decides she's not going to interrupt this, whatever the heck this is. The next day, she went out with an uh, old gossipy woman who swore, no, the Count, he, he wouldn't have anybody with them. And they go out, and there he is with that woman. And he walks, they walk up, and by the time they get there, the woman is gone. Uh, there's no place she could have gone, but she's not there. And they ask, who was she? And he said, there was nobody here. Then he said, oh, yes, that must be it. Before the family became known as Nelsini, we were known as Nelson. We were employed by the uh, king of uh, France as guards. Well, that didn't go too well, and uh, some of the family escaped to Italy, and uh, we took the name Nelsini, and I was able to uh, do well. What you saw was the Banshee, and obviously that means that my time is very close, and I'll be joining my wife. And within a few days, he was at a train station, had a heart attack, fell over, and that was it. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So, a couple, a couple different questions. I'm, they're all in my sure. mind right now. Let's start with one. 
um, they're women a lot of times. Any any thoughts around why the messenger of death t- tends to be referred to as a woman or maybe they are, I mean, I don't know if they're seen as women and if maybe people have an experience, they see this mysterious figure of a, a woman, they don't understand what it is, they share it, they share the story so it's documented, but then they ultimately pass away. I mean, you, you mm. tell me how this works, how, how this lore has lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years that we're knowing able to tell it today. So. That may well go back to prehistoric times who is going to be the shamaness? Who is going to be leading the spiritual life of the people? It would probably be an elderly woman right. who had lived her life as a healer. The wise woman. And yeah. then later on as a, as a shaman. And then after death, come back and help. Uh, her tribe. Mm. But bear in mind, not all messengers of death are uh, female. Okay. In Brittany, which is in France, uh, this is a very mystical area. You probably have been there. This is where Karnak is with all the standing stones. And there is a very famous messenger of death there. And This is where we get our modern interpretation of the Grim Reaper. His name is Anku, A-N-K-O-U, and he drives his cart over the backcountry lanes at night of Brittany, and he stops at the house where someone is going to die. And this belief is so prevalent that in some uh, very old Breton uh, graveyards, they actually have little stands, almost like altars, where people can make offerings to Anku, uh, just to kind of keep them at bay there, <laughs> you know, stay away. And another female uh, messenger of death which is uh, very close to what we were just talking about, comes from the Scandinavian countries, the Filja. If you are a Scandinavian and an old Viking, and you have a dream of a woman riding a gray horse towards you, that is the Filja also known in our um, talk as a fetch. And she will, uh, she's riding this gray horse. She comes towards you. And often she will go into a house. If you have that dream or that vision, that means you are definitely uh, going to die very soon. And there is a real quick Funny story about the field, Joe. There was a case back in the Viking times of an old man, very wise, sitting in a room. And here comes an eight-year-old boy running in. Well, of course he ran in. No eight-year-old is going to just walk into a room. (laughs) And he's running in, and all of a sudden he just falls over and uh, hits his face on the floor and gets up, bruised nose, and wonder what what the heck? Because there is absolutely nothing there. You trip on air, and this old man is just laughing himself. Well, the boy goes out angry, but he comes back later, and he said, okay, what are you laughing at? Why did I trip? He said, you did not see it. But your Filja, in the form of a small white bear, was running with you. And as soon as he saw me, he stopped, and you tripped over him. Wow. (laughs) Cool. I love it. These are beautiful stories. And, you know, some of them them are scary and dark, for sure. But some of them are also kind of, I don't know, there's almost like a little component of, you're going to be crossing over and there's someone there to kind of shepherd you across the rainbow bridge, if you will. 
the rainbow bridge there. There we go. Another I'm, one from uh, Teutonic mythology. Oh, oh, is it? I didn't realize that. I often associate it with Native American, but is that uh, is that in fact Teutonic? There, yeah, that is the bridge going to uh, Asgard, to Valhall. Aha. Uh-huh. And I am completely at a loss. I could ask my IT department in the other room. Oh, I don't have to. The guardian of that bridge is Heimdall. And if you've ever enjoyed Richard Wagner's beautiful opera, Das Rheingold, it's all about building the that Valhall and connected at the end. At the end of the opera, Donar, or Thor, is spinning this hammer around and you hear this majestic music rise up as only Wagner could do and you see the bridge appear and believe me it takes your breath away oh my gosh i must see this opera fabulous oh it you should you're in los angeles run up to seattle they have one of the finest productions of the ring every year thank you for at the least tip. they used to thank you for the tip um amazing so um this is this is great i love all these stories so much and i i too come from german heritage um so this is great where you're definitely getting into some really interesting lore that i know in my many times of doing interviews i've not had a chance to get into this this is some very very cool folklore that we have here now Banshee, uh, we talked a little bit about Banshees being women, and you said not necessarily. And w- somebody that comes to mind is the Grim Reaper. So what's the distinction yeah. between a Banshee and stories around the Grim Reaper that you may know? Uh, the Grim Reaper, which, of course, is an offshoot of Anku, is, he is the one who actually takes the soul. Oh, uh, okay. You will find there's an interesting variation of this in Greece, Now, of course, everyone is familiar with Greek mythology and Charon, the the fairy man of the dead who goes across the river Styx. Well, after the classical myths in that time had ended, uh, Charon stuck around, but he of a death spirit and when he received the word, he would go and he would collect the soul and take him back. He was what you call a psychopomp. And one, there is one of these variations with Charon in which he has a cave in which there are countless candles burning. And those are people's lives. And when one of those candles goes out, uh, he goes to get the soul of that person. This is also seen in a marvelous Japanese anime uh, series known as Hell Girl, Jigoku Shujo, in which she has all these candles, and when the candle's out, it's time. But she takes them to hell. Hell Girl. <laughs> That's yeah. good. I love that. Um, so... Banshees, one of the associations I have with them is, I mean, I'm learning so much. I think to use my term of um, Banshees, they're driving like a Banshee, it it doesn't quite work. I'm learning, I got to fix up my terminology here a little bit. But one of the associations I, I, I think of with Banshees is a sound, right? There's a wailing sound. Yes. So what? Yes. tell us a little bit about that. Well, there are two ways that a banshee normally gives the message. The first one is the washerwoman type, and that's where a woman, either an old crone or a a young, beautiful woman, is standing in a stream up to her knees in the water, washing bloody clothes. Hmm. And she's wailing and crying out at the time. Whoever clothes those are, as blood drips off and turns the water scarlet, uh, that is the person who is going to die. 
But you asked about the sound. There is a variety of sounds. Uh, there is this case where it sounds like nails on a chalkboard just grating every bit of nerve in your soul. There is a case from the County Ross Coma not too long ago where a brother and sister were sitting in a kitchen at night and, well, all of a sudden they hear this cat outside. Mm. Something must be rooting through the garbage. Normally, banshees don't root through the garbage. <laughs> But they figure, what the heck? Is there a cat out there? So the brother says, hey, this is going to be cool. Watch this. He gets up. He goes to the kitchen door, opens it, looks to the dog, say, come on, boy. Go get her. Go get her. And the dog looks up like, are you out of your mind? Do you have any idea what's out there? That time, brother and sister... They listen a little closer, and no cat ever sounded like that. He slammed the door shut. Well, wouldn't you know, the next morning they found out one of their close neighbors had uh, just died. Ah, yeah. yeah. There is a case, you know, sometimes they sound beautiful. I mean, they sound like Kirsten Flagstead is out on the lawn. And this is the case with Dr. Keenly, who was a famous Irish 19th century poet. His little brother was dying, and he was in bed, very ill. The medical doctor was there, some other men, and they examined him. And they said, well, you just you just rest here. We're, we're going to go over there and talk. And, so they walked over, and as they're walking across the room, they hear this beautiful, beautiful singing. And they get in a little huddle, and they say, no, it, it won't be much longer. He, he can't hang on. And then one of the men, obviously from not around there, said, I don't know who was singing out there, but I've been at every concert hall in Europe. I have never heard singing like that. And they looked at him like, <laughs> no, you're not going to. You just heard the banshee. At that point, Dr. Keenly realized, oh, oh, my God. Mm. He runs back to the bed. And wouldn't you know, his little brother had passed away in that short amount of time. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting, right? I mean, it's it. it it makes me kind of wonder how, if people are still having any such experiences. Oh, yes. yes. More current day, yeah? Oh, absolutely. What, I have, can you share I have cases from the 1970s. Uh, one of my favorite is from the 1940s. If I could give this real quickly. Uh, it was in... It was in Ulster, and it was near a church known as the Long Tower. Well, there's uh, houses around that, and an old man was dying in that house. And the friends and the family came by, and along with this was one of uh, probably his niece, a 12-year-old girl. And I'm sure this 12-year-old girl would rather have been anywhere else other than in the house with a bunch of crying relatives saying rosaries and, uh, and knowing a man's dying in the other room. But she's sitting there, and all of a sudden she hears knocking on the door. I hope I didn't mess up the sound there. <laughs> and she looks, all right, well, who's coming in now, and are they bringing food? Nobody goes to answer the door. I said, what, what the heck? What is going on here? And still, nope, it's like they couldn't hear the knocking, and it was quite loud. And then it happens a third time. And she, well, these idiots, I'll open the door myself, even though it's not my house. Well, she goes over to the door, opens it, 
and looks out in the yard, and there is a tiny but old woman, like a hag, like a Grimm's fairy tale witch, dressed in a cloak in fairy green. And the old woman turns around. She has what seems like glowing eyes, and she starts to walk towards the house like, ah, you're letting me in, are you? Mm. Well, she slammed the door, screamed, and fainted away. And, of course, uh, that very evening, uh, the old man they had gone to visit had passed away in the uh, in the house. Oh, okay, yeah. I mean, it's interesting, right? I mean, I really, I think it for me, it definitely starts with the the people on the other side, right? The people that we maybe already know. On the Across other side. the veil. Yes, right. And that's what's so wonderful to talk to you right now as we approach Samhain, Halloween, um, at the time of taping. And I'm sure there that must be that many more um, sort of, maybe there's that many more stories of banshee sightings at this time of year. I would, well... There is one that I could tell, but it's a little bit on the adult side. And I, I know that YouTube would not like it, but actually <laughs> happened on Salmon. And it concerned, once again, the, pers- the lady I mentioned earlier, the great goddess Aene, and a king. Oh, I even got his name here. Elil Olom. He went to the mound that all, all the fairy mound that all of the people in the village were going to and have his celebration. And he um, decided this is a wonderful place for a nap. Well, he fell asleep. But then he woke up and he had a strange mystical vision in which the whole countryside around him had been turned into a ruined desert. And he couldn't understand that. And he he was able to get back to sleep, woke up, it was morning. And the next time he went with a druid who was a seer with the name of Fergus. And he he had told them what had happened, and they went together up onto the uh, mound to see if they might see something else. Well, wouldn't you know that uh, he fell asleep again? Apparently, this was his favorite spot for a nap. But Fergus, he ignored him. He was watching, and he saw a great king of the Tuatha de Danan, the fairies, the she, walking along with Aene. And Fergus went off and got into a fight with uh, Fergus, or, or with the king. And at that point, uh, the sleeping monarch, Elil Olam, woke up and he saw the beautiful um uh, Aine. And, well, from here on, I'm afraid I'll, I'll just have to say you, you'll have to read the book. On I was just going to say, okay, yeah, you're leaving us hanging there, Stephen, but that's great. And I know that you've got a story about Abraham Lincoln in your book as well, okay. right? That, yes. So, I mean, he, you, are you going to give a little hint about that? Did Ab- Oh, did, but of course. Did, did, okay, go ahead. Uh, Lincoln had my favorite death messenger, the doppelganger, where you see a complete double of yourself. Oh, okay. And he had seen this a few times in his life, just like Percy Shelley had seen one in his lifetime. And always the, the final time is right before death. And with Lincoln... Uh, He had a dream shortly after seeing the doppelganger, which he heard mourning and crying in the White House. And he 
put on his robe, went downstairs, and here were a bunch of women in black, mourning and crying pitifully, and here was a coffin uh, all decked out, but he, he couldn't see who was in it. And there were two Union soldiers who were standing right by the coffin at strict attention, and he asked, who is dead in the White House? Mm. And one of the soldiers said, it is the president, sir. He was shot by an assassin. And very shortly afterwards was that terrible night oh, no. in uh, Ford's Theater. Wow. Now, before I leave Lincoln, if I could do, because this is really neat. Throughout a lot of cities, including Ur Urbana in Ohio, there is annually seen the ghost of Lincoln's funeral train. And it goes down the track. It hasn't been seen in maybe 50 years now, but like up into the 40s and 50s, people would actually take lawn chairs and little lunches and sit out there at night and wait for the ghost train to pass. That's incredible. The uh, train had open cars and men dressed in Union uniforms but they were all skeletons and of course lincoln's coffin is there now this is really uber weird even for people who did not see the ghost train even for those who did not even know that there's such a thing existed but they just happened to live along near to the railroad track when that train went by, their clocks would stop. Boom. 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 I believe. Yeah. I, I mean, I, 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 I haven't had a lot. I, I've had a couple ghost encounters, and I, you know, but this is this is a very specialized. And I suppose if we were going to share a tool for transformation, it would be just to keep your eyes open if you see any of these, uh, you know. These symbols. Also these... keep your ears open. And your ears. Sometimes they, uh, the death messenger will come as a knock on the door. There will be three, and there's no one there. <laughs> I have a case in that from Massachusetts, and I believe it is 1983 of a woman who heard that in the middle of the night, and, she, and this was in Boston in the winter and she went down and looked out there was no one there no footprints in the snow but her daughter came down right after said who's knocking at the door hmm. so she she obviously had heard something and the next morning she starts making calls because she had heard the stories of the death knock okay and everyone was alive then she got the call a relative in ireland just uh, died yes interesting fascinating fascinating research you've done here all in your book the beware the banshees cry right and so many different stories Stephen. you are a wonderful Stephen tell uh, storyteller thank you and well, thank um you. and uh you know just really really well researched i mean i i look forward to seeing further details thank you so much for sharing so much this has been fantastic well, thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, tell us before you go, please tell us your Facebook handle so people can find you there. Uh, Facebook is Stephen J. Rolfus. All right. That's great. Thanks again. And I look forward to um, checking out your book very soon. Ho happy okay. Halloween if we don't talk before. Happy Salmon. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching, everybody. We are here definitely to share tools for transformation. But in this case, I think we're really looking at some interesting history. And I think that that's one of the things that we want to do with our foundation, our nonprofit that Club Paranormal is a part of. It's called Earthly Beings Foundation. And we're really looking to preserve these stories um, of yesteryear to have a better understanding of what did our what did the what did our elders know that we're ignoring? So in this case, how interesting to just be very acutely aware of all energies around us, 
what are they trying to tell us? So that would be my takeaway tool. I'm Bonnie Burkert with new episodes every week. Don't forget to join Tony Sweet Fridays at 3 p.m. live. Um, He likes to gather the Truth Be Told community. So jump into the chat room and say hi. Robert Hensley is also creating new shows as well as our new group, Queer Eye from Queer from the Other Side. Um, so again, check us out on the Club Paranormal Network on YouTube and wherever you check out your um, podcast, you can find us as Truth Be Told Paranormal. Until the next time, shine on. <laughs>